Hello everyone, my name is Beth Gilligan. I'm Director of Development and Marketing at the Coolidge Corner Theater. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's special presentation of Science on Screen. We're of course gonna be talking about the movie Clueless, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, we are not gonna be showing the movie, however, if you if you haven't memorized it already, you can find it, of course, streaming in, in many places and hopefully back on screen at the theater sometime soon. Um, I just wanna thank you all for your support. This past year has been a very challenging one in the life of the Coolidge. Um, we are a nonprofit organization and just the messages we've received, um, the donations we've received, general goodwill from the community is, um, we really appreciate it and it's sort of helped us carry through. Um, we look forward to reopening someday, hopefully not too far in the future. Um, we are op um, open for private rentals now if you wanna get your pod together and, and watch a film on screen at the Coolidge. Um, but again, hope to be able to have you all in person soon. Um, so just a few words about tonight. Um, this is part of the National Evening of Science on Screen. So we're joining with independent theaters in 24 cities and 17 states to host in-person and online programmings of films with science speakers. So there's a full listing of events available at scienceonscreen.org. Um, unless you are will, <laughs> looking to binge all of those events tonight, um, they are gonna be available online after the fact. And those links will also be up on scienceonscreen.org if you wanna check them out. The topics are ranging from the proliferation of conspiracy theories in the time of epidemic, that's gonna be at the Ragtag Cinema in Missouri, the science of beer making, the educational value of taxidermy, dark side digital technology, representation in science, and of course, game theory in Jane Austen's novels. So this should be an excellent discussion. I, I promise you at the end, you'll see Jane Austen and Cher Horowitz in, in new <laughs> and unexpected ways. Um, but I wanna thank our sponsors, uh, particularly the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which provides major support for this program and to Doran Weber, who is the VP of programs there. We've been partnering with Sloan for uh, over a decade now. And during that time, we've been able to award 274 grants to 96 different art house theaters and museums nationwide so they can start or sustain their own science sunscreen programs. Um, we also wanna thank our local sponsors, Ruben Anders Scientific, Ellen Hoffman and Ken Loveday. And uh, finally, I just wanna introduce our wonderful speaker, um, Michael Che. He is a professor of political sci science at UCLA. His research centers on game theory and its applications to social movements, voting and information aggregation, social networks, monetary policy, violence, and literature. He has served as co-editor of the American Political Science Review and on the editorial boards of the Journal of Economic Behavior and the American Journal of Sociology. His most recent book, Jane Austen, Game Theorist, finds common ground between the study of people's choices and the writing of the early 19th century English novelist. He has also served on the faculty of University of Chicago and NYU. And finally, before we get to his presentation, if you have any questions for him, um, please feel free to pop them in the chat. We can try to get to them after he's done with his presentation. But thank you again for joining us, Michael. And take it away. Tell us about oh, Thank you so much, Beth. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I really appreciate the invitation from the Coolidge. And I know that um, theaters and performing arts organizations have had a really tough year this last year. So I really think it's great that we can support in any way possible. So I feel honored that I'm able to participate in this way. And it's also great to be able to participate in this science on screen event happening in many, many theaters nationwide. So thank you so much. Um, so I guess I have some slides, so maybe uh, I'll go over to them. Yeah, if you have any questions, please, I'm happy to talk about them and uh, um, you know, put them in the chat. I'll address them at the end. Okay, let's see. Okay. Can folks see this? This is a, uh, you should say game theory and clues list at the top. Is that okay? Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so that's me. Um, by the way, it's time to stop patient hate. So in my uh, talk today, I'm gonna to first talk a little bit about what game theory is. One of the main assumptions and guiding principles of game theory is it's about strategic thinking. And I'll talk about what that means. And I'll also talk about what I call cluelessness, cluelessness, which is the conspicuous absence of strategic thinking. So people are generally pretty good at strategic thinking, but sometimes they're really bad at it. And this absence is like, 
is to me something which is interesting in, in which I call cluelessness. And um, in addition, what causes cluelessness? I will say cluelessness is caused by a fixation on social status and ceremony. And I will say how the movie Clueless illustrates this. And of course, Austin's books um, also illustrate this. And true intimacy is achieved by getting over this obsession, this obsession with social status and ceremony. Okay, All right. So um, let's talk about game theory first. So I'm a game theorist. What do game theorists do? So game theory starts by representing people's decisions using diagrams like this one. So here I have a consumer who's choosing between an apple and a banana. So I wake up thinking, am I gonna have an apple or banana today for breakfast? Okay, and so you just write down the consumer as like a little dot and the apple and banana are choices are represented as branches coming out of this dot. And then at the end you say, well, an apple would be great, banana's okay. So these correspond to your preferences over um, these outcomes. And uh, um, that's it. That's basically what game theorists do. It's pretty simple. You just represent things, social situations in this way. Okay, um, it turns out though that often there's more than one person and this is how things get interesting. So for example, say that a man chooses to propose or not, if a man chooses to propose, it's not like it ends there, right? Then, then it's, we're assuming heterosexuality, I guess. Um, if a man chooses to propose, the woman then can then choose to accept or refuse. In other words, this situation involves two people. So there are actually three possible outcomes now, right? So one is where the man doesn't do anything, and maybe that's okay for the man. I wrote that as red because the man is um, indicated by red. I'm also indicating the woman's preferences by blue. It's also okay for the woman, it's sort of neutral. If the man proposes, the woman refuses. Can I have this? That's pretty bad, it's embarrassing for the man and the woman doesn't feel good about refusing. And um, if the man proposes, the woman accepts, then in my example, it's great for everyone. Okay, so this is kind of a happy situation. And this is a simple diagram of a pretty basic um, human interaction. A person makes a, a request and, a, and if the request is made, the person receiving the request has to accept or refuse. Okay. All right. So as you might expect, things can get quickly complicated and mathematical. So for example, say I take up what is really a pretty simple game like tic-tac-toe. The first player has actually some sort of three basic choices, um, if you count symmetry. And then given that two, person two has like two choices there, two has five choices there, and it quickly gets super, super large, even in a very simple game. And if you can imagine something like chess is super, super huge. But one of the ideas of game theory is that all these things, no matter how complicated, all rely on the same basic methodology of drawing these trees. So it's all kind of the same um, theoretical structure. And so um, as you probably know, if you learn how to play tic-tac-toe, you generally figure out how to kind of solve this game. And similarly, um, Computer programs, programs that you're very good at chess are very good at looking through these trees. Okay. So this is kind of the mathematical end of game theory. Okay. And a key assumption is that people think strategically, that is they employ strategic thinking. What does that mean? It means when a person makes a decision, they think about what other people will do. That is when I decide to make a proposal or not, I think about what the person I make the proposal to will do. So for example, if the man chooses to propose or not, Woman chooses to whether to accept or refuse. That's my original scenario. Okay. We will say that in this scenario, this is different from, for example, this scenario, which is the man proposes or not. Woman chooses to accept or refuse. The preferences are slightly different in the sense that before the woman thought that accepting was great, now she thinks it's terrible. Okay. How are these two situations different? Well, here in this situation, the woman, instead of accepting, will refuse because awful is worse than bad. Okay, and then the man thinking strategically will realize, hey, if I propose, the woman's not gonna accept. The woman, in fact, will refuse because I know that she thinks my proposal is awful. She will refuse, and therefore, I will not propose in the first place. I'd rather choose okay than bad. Okay, so the idea of strategic thinking is that a person thinks about what other people will do before they take their action. Okay, this is the very foundational concept in game theory. Okay, all right. So are people good at strategic thinking? And kind of this is where the science, part of the science on screen comes in. So um, 
if you think people are pretty good at strategic thinking, then you can use these models to explain human behavior. That's what economists, political scientists, all social scientists do is they think, hmm, you know, I can take a situation, model with these trees, and then kind of predict what people will do. And um, if people are pretty good at strategic thinking, then that prediction will make sense. That will be an explanation of their behavior. Okay. But sometimes strategic thinking is conspicuously absent. Okay. That sometimes people really do not do a good job at thinking about what other people are going to do. So um, from the point of view of game theory, we want to know this because we want to know when are our games, our diagrams are not going to be helpful. Okay. And it's also interesting to me as a social scientist, this is an interesting phenomenon in itself. Why do sometimes people not strategic, think strategically? And to me, this is an interesting enough phenomenon that I call it cluelessness. And I called it cluelessness after, in fact, the movie Clueless, um, which uh, we're all talking about today. So I consider the movie Clueless as, like Oss's novels, as exploring a social scientific concept. Okay, That is why people are clueless. And if we start by talking about Austin, so this is from Emma. Obviously, Clueless is based on Austin's novel, Emma. And in this novel, Emma, the character says, it is always incomprehensible to a man that a woman should ever refuse an offer of marriage. A man always imagines a woman to be ready for anybody who asks her. What is Emma saying here? She's saying that men, when making a proposal, are generally clueless. That is, they don't think about a woman as even making a possible choice in response. They always imagine a woman as just sort of saying, fine. Okay. Men don't even think, don't even comprehend the possibility of women making a choice. Okay. In other words, the clueless man thinks that this situation, this is my original situation. This is where a man chooses to propose or not, and the woman gets to accept or refuse. This actually looks like this. This a man just thinks of the situation as proposing, that's great. Not proposing, that's okay. And the man doesn't even think about the woman as having a choice. Okay, so this is the cover of my book. Um, and I just sort of play with that here. Here the man is thinking I'm going to propose or not, but the woman is, of course, realizing and understanding it as a more complicated game in which, of course, she has the choice to accept or refuse. Okay, so not realizing that other people have choices is the most basic form of cluelessness. Okay, that is, thinking that other people are not independent thinkers. That's the most basic form of cluelessness. But what the movie Clueless is about, to me, is a little bit beyond that. And similarly for Austin's Emma, these Clueless, the movie, and Austin's Emma explores sort of a higher level of cluelessness, which is a cluelessness where you understand people are um, independent actors, they think independently, they make their own choices, but you're very confident, overly confident in your knowledge of their motivations. That is, you you know people are making choices, but you're so confident in how they will make their choices. You're so confident in what their preferences are that you believe in it so strongly that you you make, make huge errors and in fact becomes solipsistic. That is, it becomes again, all your own world. Okay, so let's now talk about things for the movie. So. Um, Obviously, you know, we're all human beings. We're all trying to figure out what other people's motivations are. And there's simple ways of doing this. So like in this scene, toward the latter part of the movie, Cher is observing Ty. This is a skateboard match with a Travis. And Cher says, when I saw the sparks between Ty and Travis, I knew Josh was out of the picture. So by observation, Cher is saying, hey, um, Ty probably likes Travis. I'm making now an inference about what Ty's motivations are. Okay, For example, if I go after uh, um, Josh, then Ty's not going to be upset. Oh, by the way, um, there will be major spoilers in this presentation. So if you haven't seen the movie, maybe you should see the movie and then come back. <laughs> However, much of the movie, in fact, like the great majority of the movie is about how um, Cher's understanding of other people's motivations is completely wrong. So in this case, Cher says, sometimes you have to show a little skin. This reminds guys of being naked in this um Seen in the classroom, Cher is trying to attract attention of um, this fellow Christian, but of course, um, later we find out that Christian is not heterosexual. And so Cher is completely um, wrong in this. And in fact, what's interesting about this again is how confident Cher is in her um, estimation of what's going on in Christian's mind. And sometimes this kind of um, 
estimation of other people's minds can be so strong and arrogant that it's a little scary. So in this case, for example, Cher says to Josh in a reproachful manner, I know what you're thinking. Cher is saying, I actually think I know what's going on in your brain. Okay. And uh, almost better than you do yourself. Okay, so being a, overconfident and knowing another person's motivations can be just as solipsistic as not understanding that other people have choices. So again, it's kind of a, um, another sort of higher form of solipsism. This is the higher level of cluelessness that I'm talking about. So um, it's the title of the movie, Clueless. How is the term cluelessly used in the movie? And um, I'm going to try to talk about this to explain why I think that this movie is about cluelessness in the in the technical term which I'm using it. Okay, so in the movie, the term cluelessness is used four times. Okay, the first time is when Ty shows up. Um, this is the Harriet character. When Ty shows up at their school, shares to her friend Dion, would you look at that girl? She is so adorably clueless. What is cluelessness? What does clueless mean here? It means that Ty just doesn't know the social situation. You know, she's new to the school. She doesn't know who the uh, people are. So it's just kind of not knowing things. So it's not a technical term in some sense. Second term the movie used, second time that the movie uses the term clueless is when um, Ty comes over to uh, Cher's house after, and Ty's there for a makeover. Josh says, I'm amazed that you found someone even more clueless than you are to worship you. And again, clueless here is used and just kind of, uh, you know, not knowing what's going on in the world, not watching the news, you know, just being unaware. Okay, but the third time, we're getting homing into a more precise definition of clueless. Okay, after Christian rescues Ty from two guys who are holding her over a balcony railing at the mall. So this is from a scene in Emma where uh, um, um, a woman is kind of harassed by gypsies in the forest or something. Okay. So Christian saves her. Cher says to herself, boy, considering how clueless she was, Ty certainly had that damsel in distress act down. So what does cluelessness mean here? What does clueless mean here? So clueless here does not mean that Ty doesn't know who the people are or is new to the social situation. Ty's been there for a while. What Cher means more specifically is that Ty, she thought that Ty was not strategically sophisticated. She thought that Ty did not employ strategic thinking. By clueless, Cher is saying, Cher's, uh, Ty is the kind of person who doesn't think strategically, okay? who doesn't realize that by doing this damsel in distress act, you can get people to save you and hence um, get people maybe to like you. Okay. Here's the fourth and most famous <laughs> Use of the term clueless. Cher goes on a walk, very distraught from all the failures she's had in her life, including um, failing her driving, driving exam. She says, everything I think and everything I do is wrong. I was wrong about Elton. I was wrong about Christian. Now oh, Josh hated me. It all boiled down to one inevitable conclusion. I was just totally clueless. What does clueless mean here? It doesn't mean that she doesn't know anything about her situation or is generally ignorant. What it means specifically is that she's not good she realizes how wrong she was and how overconfident she was in her estimation of other people's desires, other people's preferences. Okay, She was wrong about Elton. She thought that Elton was interested in Ty, not her. She was wrong about Christian sexuality. She was wrong about Josh also. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. So to me, what makes Clueless a, about kind of a, a kind of social science, the kind of... Uh, um, argument about human beings, I guess like not, like just, not just a kind of social science. I, I agree, argue that it is social science. It is a, an inquiry into why people do certain things. And similarly, Austin's books are like that. Austin's books are an inquiry in why people behave the way they do. The main question which is asked and answered is what causes cluelessness? And the answer given is an obsession with social status and ceremony. So, um, I'm going to now present the argument, okay? So the movie starts out like many, many teen movies with kind of a survey of the social landscape, which is, this is very cliche written, which is sort of a scene about this group, a scene about, you know, the athletes, a scene about the jocks, a scene about the theater nerds, whatever. So it goes like this. So um, it's not that surprising that we have this kind of uh, sequence of scenes. Sharon Dion talk about um, the folks who do the TV station. 
talk about the Persian Mafia. These are the so-called status groups in the school. They talk about Elton and the White Fest, um, all the most popular boys in the school. These are the only acceptable people to date. Okay. And uh, um, this is a very common cliche in the movie, in all teen movies, but here it really brings up, introduces the whole kind of vocabulary of status. So after this, this is all part of uh, Sharon Dion introducing Ty to this school. So Ty meets Travis in kind of the cafeteria lunch line. Ty's excited about Travis. And uh, um, Ty says, well, you know, Travis offered me something to smoke. And then um, Dion and Cher decide to uh, put, teach Ty and <laughs> the right status of distinctions. Just after Ty meets Travis for the first time, Dion says, they say, well, you know, it's different between smoking like every day versus smoking at a party. And Dion says, do you see the distinction? You get a very clear distinction, literally using the word distinction. And by distinction, they don't mean just distinction in acts. They mean a distinction in terms of social status. That is, Lodi's generally hang on that grassy knoll over there. A distinction in status, not just a distinction of action. And this distinction in status is shown by a distinction of terminology and location. In the famous carriage scene, or in this case, a car scene between Elton, Elton says, why would I go with Ty? So um, Cher has been trying to get Ty to like Elton. And um, Elton says, why would I go with Ty? Don't you even know who my father is? Me and Ty, we don't make any sense. Me and you, it makes sense. So Elton's reasoning about why he would be attracted to another person is all about status. Okay, that he's saying that his status is similar to Cher's status. This is a scene later in the movie. Travis approaches. This is after um, the balcony scene. So Ty is, sorry, Ty is now newly popular. Travis approaches, but Ty responds, don't the slackers prefer that grassy knoll over there? Using very explicit kind of uh, status-based language. Okay. And now for the first time, Ty shares thinking that, well, actually Ty is kind of mean. And maybe ties, maybe Cher starts to doubt her own fixation on status. And this is also accompanied by Cher feeling that maybe her own status is now threatened by Ty's new popularity. She Cher actually uses the term, um, is this an, an altered universe? So finally, in this very, very important scene, after Ty, and this is now Ty expresses interest in Josh. And of course, Cher thinks this is just inconceivable. Cher responds, but Ty, do you really think you'd be good with Josh? I mean, he's like a school nerd. Again, the language of status, the language of kinds of people. Ty responds, what? Am I some sort of mentally challenged airhead? I'm not good enough? Again, the language of status for Josh or something. And then the most famous line in the movie, Ty fires back, you're a virgin who can't drive. And again, this is so hurtful because it uses the terms of status, right? It, it's a, um, she's trying to put Cher in her place, yeah? I'm um, using terms of status. Um, Cher did not, just, just a moment ago, Cher did not, did not achieve the status of being a good driver through the um, driving test. Okay, they make up afterward. And then what's interesting is in this makeup scene between Cher and Ty, they don't use status terms. And they now they've learned that what's important is your feelings, that is your preferences, what you want, not what your status you have. So Cher says, I cannot even believe I was so unsupportive of your feelings for Josh, of, of your, your preferences, the fact that you like Josh. It's not about your status. It's about who you like and what you want. So for me, what Clueless and Emma is about is how Cher learns that status-oriented thinking is holding her back from true strategic thinking and also love. And so um, let me just compare two staircase scenes. So when you see this movie, um, to me, the whole movie is kind of encapsulated in the contrast between these two scenes. So in the first stairs scene, Cher starts walking down. This is after Cher has been um, invited out by Christian and Cher sees this as a um, ceremony because Cher says, oh, you've got to make him wait. You know, Cher says to ask her dad, and then Josh to please, you know, answer the door for her so she can make a Christian wait. So in the first scene, Cher starts walking down and there's lush background music, very romantic music, but she starts a bit hesitantly and she looks to her left looking for a reaction, which uh, Josh provides. Josh is there working in the house. 
um, in the, for uh, Mel's lawsuit, Mel's uh, Cher's father. Of course, once Josh provides the look, Cher sees it, Cher smiles and walks more openly and confidently. But she's there um, titularly, that is, um, Cher is there to meet Christian. I mean, that's supposedly what that's going about. Cher says Christian, Christian says dollface. They use terms um, which talk about each other's appearance. And uh, um, Josh now is a little like now concerned. <laughs> Josh says to Mel, you're not letting her out go like that? You're not letting her go out like that, are you? Josh says, I didn't like him. This is after they leave. Maybe I should go to the party. Okay. And to me, what's interesting about this scene too, if it is here, when when Cher is smiling, we don't know who Cher is smiling at, but um, we see that like Christian and Josh are in the same direction. So it's equally conceivable that Cher could be smiling at Josh or a Christian. But in any case, what's very important is that Cher or the movie maker set it up so that Josh can see that Christian admires Cher, right? So the desired effect perhaps is that Cher wants to make sure that Josh knows that Cher is desired. Okay, in an earlier scene, Cher delivers uh, candy to herself to, to show the, that she's desired by other people. Okay, and this is one thing which can only be done in cinema that you can kind of do ambiguities about who is seeing who, okay? It's kind of interesting. Anyway, um, so Josh now says, hey, you don't need me, do you? Unless you want, then Mel shares father says, oh, Josh, go to the party. Josh says, I'll watch her for you. And Mel says, you do that. And this smile to me is hilarious too, because um, it makes you wonder, maybe Mel is actually behind this entire thing <laughs> that Mel is the person who brought Josh into the house, right? Um, Mel invited Josh for dinner. Mel asked Josh to um, accompany Cher um, in her driving, okay, because uh, she, Mel prohibited uh, Cher from practicing um, driving from share, practicing driving with a Dion. Um, and for that matter, Mel got share, you know, involved in the lawsuit. So, you know, maybe this is all about Mel, you know? This is an interesting question, which is left unanswered, just like so many interesting uh, strategic moves in Austin's novels are left unanswered. Okay, so that's the first staircase scene. This is the later second staircase scene. This happens after um, Cher and, uh, um, Josh are working on a lawsuit along with another junior lawyer. The junior lawyer gets upset that Cher maybe messed something up. And then the junior lawyer storms off. Cher retreats to the top of the staircase saying, did I really ruin daddy's lawsuit? Josh consoles her and says, no, of course not. Don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. Josh says, I want to be a lawyer, but you, I mean, you don't have to be doing this. Go out and have fun, go shopping. Cher says, well, you think that's all I do? I'm just a ditz with a credit card. And Cher is reproaching him because she's saying, reproaching her him for using status-based language, okay? This is not, you know, John says, go out and have fun, go shopping, okay? It's not like, you know, you're a different kind of person. Cher is saying, are you, do you really think I'm a different kind of person? Okay, it's, so Cher is reproaching him. Status language is not the way to go. John says, no, no, that's not what I meant. It's just, um, uh, the, so this, Stammering is exactly in parallel with the same scene in Emma, okay, where uh, Mr. Knightley goes to Emma and kind of has trouble getting the words out. It's an exact parallel of that. And so when I saw this scene, you can't help but think of this little um, line in Emma where, what does she say? This is Emma's, Austin is describing Emma. What did she say? So that's what she ought, of course, a lady always does. She said enough to show that there need not be despair and to invite him to say more himself. That is, Cher simply tries to draw out what Josh is going to say. Josh says, you're young and beautiful and, again, stammering. Cher, and? Josh, and, oh, uh, well, what? Cher says, you think I'm beautiful? And to me, this is very interesting because she didn't say, I'm beautiful in the sense of I have the status of being beautiful or other people I think I'm beautiful. What's important is that Josh says, Josh's mental state, Cher understands this now. It's not about status or about other people think, it's all about what Josh thinks. Josh, so it's not that Cher says, I'm not beautiful or something like that, or, or 
Cher doesn't approach the statement, I'm beautiful, as a fact, as an objective fact. Rather, she understands Josh saying I'm beautiful as an expression of what he believes. So Cher says, you think I'm, believe, I'm beautiful. You believe I'm beautiful. Okay. So, so um, they kiss in the staircase, previously used for ceremony. So now, to me, this whole this is this these two scenes that capture the whole movie. The staircase previously used, which is a beautiful kind of ceremonial staircase used for ceremonies, is now repurposed in a backstage moment into a moment of true intimacy. And this is how true intimacy is now created. Okay, not through status, not through show or ceremony, okay, but through an understanding of our true feelings for each other, our true desires. Okay, to me. Um, so now this in the movie, this goes immediately to the next, and to me, my favorite little moment, which is the immediate um, cut to this scene, which is the marriage scene. And Cher says, as if. <laughs> so what's great about this is that it's now playing with our expectations about status. We think, oh, when people love each other, the next step is, of course, a status change into being married. But uh, now the film takes the um, viewpoint that now we should be skeptical of status. Okay, we should be skeptical of this stuff. This is not what true love is about. Okay, and during the um, wedding, you know, Ty and Dion talk about what they will do in their weddings, but Cher does not participate because in some sense now she realizes she's more mature in some sense. She understands what love is about. She doesn't participate in the discussion. To me, this is about showing how Cher is actually now in some sense more mature than Ty and Dion. She has a, a higher level of understanding. And when they kiss, um, it's not for other people, it's for themselves. Okay, it's not a kiss performed in a ceremony. Okay, but you could say in some sense that they are still nodding towards ceremony. Okay, the Cher just uh, uh, caught the bouquet uh, um, uh, thrown by Miss Geist, which is kind of like a ceremony, but a secondary one. Okay, so she's holding the bouquet there. So um, I guess you could say the movie ends with skepticism, but a nod towards ceremony. Okay. Um, I guess that's it, I guess. Yeah, I guess it's, um, I have more slides, but we can go them, do them more if uh, um, people want to um, ask questions about it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. That was terrific. Um, oh, we've got some comments, um, oh, great. but no questions. Um, I think uh, the next science on screen themed presentation related to Clueless will be Paul Rudd. How does he not age? <laughs> and on that. Um, but thank you so much, Michael, for joining us tonight. Um, again, anyone who would like to tune in to additional offerings for the National Evening of Science on Screen um, can go to scienceonscreen.org for more information. But uh, thank you again. Have a good evening, everyone. All right. Good night. Oh, I'm Audi. Thank <laughs> you.